Hi, I'm Hannah Brown, and welcome to Better Tomorrow. My absolute favorite thing to do is have a heart-to-heart talk with my new friends and my best friends, where we sit down and talk about all the things like relationships and love, faith, and self-care. And of course, the little things as well, like the struggle to figure out what to eat tonight. All in all, I really want to ask, how am I better today than yesterday? And bring artists, entrepreneurs, and friends along on the journey. So join me on the journey, will you? You guys, we have a bonus episode for you today. I am so pumped because this episode is all about my new book, Mistakes We Never Made, which is out this week. I am so pumped. And I've been talking a lot about the book on my other platforms, but haven't really talked about it much on the podcast. So a lot of you guys have questions for me about this new book. It is a novel. It's my very first novel. So I thought it'd be fun to answer some of the most common questions that I'm getting. And at the end of this episode, I have a sample audio of the audiobook for you guys so that you can get a little taste of um, what this book is all about. And then you can go and order it for yourself or go get it in bookstores this week. I'm so pumped. Um, so yeah, let's just get into it. So I have been doing so much press for this book. I kind of wanted to give a little recap of everything that I've been doing. Um, A week or two ago, I was in LA and kind of started like a mini press tour. I went on a lot of different podcasts. And I also did the LA Times Festival of Books, which is like my first like big um, event as an author. I did a panel uh, Q&A with other authors in this space, which at first I was a little intimidated by. Um, You know, I think like anything, whenever you're new at something, it can be really easy to feel like, I don't belong here. Why am I here? Am I going to sound stupid? These people have been, you know, authors for so long in this space. I've just so much more experience than I I do. Um, And it was such an honor to be able to be at this panel. But um, the the other women there were so amazing. I was so inspired by them. And we had a really a great time. And I felt really excited about talking about this book. I've had a lot of opportunities um, in the past few years just in my career. But this has been the one that I've been just most excited about because I really do see this as a new career path for me. And it's actually been the the one thing that I've known that I've always wanted to do out of all the experiences that I've had. So it was really cool to have that first opportunity to really um, showcase myself as an author. Like that is what I was being known for. Not some girl from reality TV, not a podcaster, not somebody from social media, but as an author. So that was really cool last week. And I got to meet a lot of you guys out there. And um, I got these adorable friendship bracelets that I wanted to make sure that I wore um, that some of the girls there that I got to do a little signing with gave me. So thank you so much for those if you're listening. Um, But it's just been great. Like the community has been awesome. I went to some bookstores that we are selling like special signed copies, signed a bunch of those. Um, What else did we do? It was great. I always love when I'm back in LA and it was so awesome to be able to just talk my ear off, or not my ear off, everyone else's ear off (laughs) about this new project. So I got just a list of questions that um, a lot of y'all have have been sending to me and wanted to just kind of go through. Um, Because some of you are like, wait, you have a book? You wrote a novel? What? I thought you were a girl that just gave out roses and now just like talks random things and no, this is actually some, this is another big part of my life, and um, it's been so awesome. So the book is called Mistakes We Never Made, and one of the questions I have is just like, what is this book about? Well, it is a romance novel, and it is about the main character Emma, who is kind of like this like type A girl. Always feels like she has to be the person in charge, taking care of everyone, and. It is her best friend's wedding weekend. So obviously she is the perfect maid of honor, the type of maid of honor that you want, you know, leading the charge in for this wedding weekend. And um, she's there with all her, her girlfriends. And unfortunately, her best friend Sybil 
is also very good friends with her, I would say like her almost maybe in life, Finn Hughes. He's not a bad guy. He just hasn't fully always got it right. You know, he's, he's one of those. I would say this is like a frenemies to lovers type situation. And we, uh, everything's going good. Emma's fine. Can, can handle Finn until her best friend Sybil goes missing two days before she's supposed to walk down the aisle. So, of course, Emma feels like it is her job to find Sybil and make sure she doesn't make what she thinks would be the worst mistake of her life. And she has to enlist the help of Finn because he has quite literally the keys um, to be able to help her get Sybil back. So they go on this crazy road trip trying to track Sybil to get her back in time. And in the meantime, you know, do we see these enemies become lovers? And it's, it's, it's obviously like that's a fun read and it's like this epic road trip and has all the things that make a wonderful beach read. But it was really important for me that Emma um, have a lot of depth and, she has to not only go on the journey of like trying to find a runaway bride, but also go on the journey with herself of like, why do I feel like this is my um, problem? Why, why do I always feel like I'm the one that has to fix things? And a lot of that for, for a lot of us, the reason that we are the way we are is there's some deep rooted fear or belief that we have about ourselves. And so um, there's also this other storyline going on that was really important for me to really have people understand why why Emma is the way that she is. And it has a lot to do with like her childhood and relationship with her father. And it's just a really beautiful story as, as she becomes to come. She comes to terms with um, some of the hurt in her life and how love can can heal that. And yeah, so that's kind of like my little pitch for the book. Um, it's a really fun, quick read. Um, a lot of you are, are asking like what made me want to write a romance novel. And I have always loved to read and I've always like written for myself. and. I obviously have had a history with, you know, my own love story for you guys to um, watch unfold on screen, off screen. And when I was deciding that, okay, I'm going to do this, I want to write a novel, I want to write a piece of fiction, it made sense for it to be from um, in this romance genre because. Although this is something for me, I want it to be something that really resonates with you guys. And the thing that most of you have been a part of is just rooting for love. So, you know, y'all have done such a great job and have been so supportive on my love story. So I thought, you know, I'm going to create more love stories for you guys to enjoy. And um, one of the questions that I get asked a lot is like, how much of this story is your own? And like, is Emma me? And this is a totally like made up story. Okay. I've, I've, I've not had a friend become a runaway bride and I've not been in on a road trip with, you know, a guy from my past that has not happened, but I will say Emma is definitely a part of me in this book. There are, um, a, a group of girlfriends, which is Emma, Sybil, Willow, and Nikki, and they are the core four. And, that was actually one of the first pieces of this idea for me is I really wanted um, a book that really um, showed the power of female friendship because I think one of the most beautiful love stories that you can have in life is is with your friends and the love that you can have and the support that you can have for them. So that was really important for me. And I was like, oh, well, what about this? Um, these these women are all parts of me because I can't write from anything that I don't uh, really have any um, I don't know touch points with. Like, yes, this is a, a book of fiction, but there has to be truth for at least me to start um, 
to be able to build something from. So Emma is a part of me, just like the other women in this book that you will get to meet and hopefully will continue to, you know, want to know more on. There are parts of me. And so Emma is that part of me, especially I really relate to this part of me. It was definitely the leader of the pack when I was like in high school and in college. It just felt like I had to perform and achieve and keep it all together and make sure that I made I, I just felt like I had to be that role, if that makes sense. And and that came from wounds in my past of why I felt that that was the way that I needed to be perceived and um, had to achieve in that way. So that is that is where this character development comes from. I wouldn't really be able to like develop a character that I didn't have like some deep relationship with. Um, and then, of course, we were like, oh, my gosh, who's Finn in the book? Like, is that is it somebody that we've seen you in a relationship with? And I would say no, but he is a compilation of, of people in my past. Um, in my advanced copy, I wrote a little letter to, to readers. And I, I the best way to say it, he is a he is all my greatest hits combined, but also a little bit of myself in there, because I like I said, I can't write from anything that I don't at least have some type of pull to. Um, let me think. Oh, uh, and then just like any like personal experiences in the book. It's interesting. I feel like I have Easter eggs like Taylor Swift um, always leaves in her music. I've tried to like do that in this book, but in ways that you probably wouldn't even know. Like one of like the things is like the, the place where this wedding weekend is set is called Cleo Ranch in the book, but it's um, Calamigos Ranch in Malibu because I was I went to a wedding there and I was like, this is the setting that I want this book to be in. It's so beautiful. I need to have this. So like, there's things like that that kind of I drew inspiration from and and what that wedding weekend was like. So it was easy to like write all the de- description of that because I'd been there. I felt that, done that. And then like um, the way that Emma meets her best friend, Sybil, who is the bride in the in the book, is actually um, how I met one of my best friends in elementary school. Um, it's really cute. They meet uh, over Sybil complimenting um, Emma's outfit um, it, when they were in elementary school and I was pretty shy and like, just like, I don't know. I, I, I do have this like shyness about me. And I remember like in kindergarten being in the bathroom, hadn't really made friends yet. And I'd gone to the bathroom and then my friend shout out Anna Taylor. Um, we were washing our hands and she looked over at my shorts and she said, I like your shorts. And I said, thanks. And after that, we walked out. We were best friends. <laughs> I think that's just how it works when you're, um, when you're little. But yeah, like little, like little things like that are all throughout the book. Um, that that was just fun being able to put parts of myself in there. Um, I this is not my first uh, book. So I got asked what was harder, writing a book about my life or this new project, like writing a novel. And they're very different. Um, You know, I have all the plot points when it comes to my own life because I've lived it. I've experienced it. That was hard more so not creatively, but just being willing to share and then having to relive painful experiences. It was very cathartic. I remember I felt I was probably one of my most, like (laughs) most depressed, most like emotional times. My life was writing that book. And the day that it went out, it was like, I I was stressed the whole time and not feeling good, but it was like the day that it it was out for everyone to read. I just felt like a weight lifted off of me because I didn't have to like have fear anymore. I was like, it was out. It was done. So that was what's so hard about that book. But with this book, um, what was really challenging was just the creative process of it. Like there's so much more that goes into it to really create the plot points. And some people like 
organization is hard for me in a lot of things, but like it was very important to have like the organization of, okay, we have this idea. These are the plot points that are ha- are going to happen along the way and then get into it. Some people don't do it that way. That's how I did it with my team. And then you could, you could have everything out. And then when you get on the page, it's just not working out. And then you have to be like, okay, this is just not working. So then you have to go back and figure out, okay, like how do we make this person more human and develop this more? So it just, it takes a lot of work, a lot of rewrites. Um, So I would say this was a bigger feat. Um, So just, just hard in different ways, but this has been more like exciting and fun to talk about in a way because it is part of me, but it's a little bit detached. Um, And it's just like something that I want to continue to do. Um, One thing that I wanted to just like uh, talk to you guys about is like, what are some romance tropes that are in this book? And like romance tropes, for those of you who don't like read these type of books, like there's certain like, how would I describe a trope? Like things that there's always in, in a romance novel, there's always a happily ever after. We know that. So it makes it challenging because you have to figure out how you're going to get there. Like everyone knows that we're going to get to happily ever after at the end. So it's like, how do you get there? So there's, there's cr- uh, common techniques or types of stories that go into those. So for, for, for my book, uh, this is a second chance romance. So it is two people who have had history in the past that it didn't work out and they've come together. This one's different when it comes to a second chance romance because they never were actually together um, in the past. They were always just like the, the almost young um, MN Finn meet in high school. So like the, they have just a lot of history. And so that this is different than a second chance of like they were together. They were, you know, had a relationship. It didn't work out and they come back together in the end. So it it is still, but it's still considered a second chance. There's also enemies to lovers, which I would say this is like frenemies to lovers. <laughs> um, and then uh, another trope in this book is obviously like it could be like a road trip is a trope that we can we see a lot and and people love. I love ro- road trip tropes. I love the banter of like when Harry met Sally, and that's kind of been this book too. So um You'll rec- you'll recognize this now, like the different types of tropes in your favorite romantic comedy movies and your favorite books. But those are some tropes at play. If you love second chance romance, you will love this book. If you love like a frenemies, enemies to lovers, you will love this book. Um, my hope is that as Emma is going on her journey to learn more about herself, that you um, learn more about yourself as well through her experience. That is like my biggest hope. And I think the main thing to learn from this book is, you know, it's not really a mistake to take a risk. I think the worst thing in life um, is to live in fear of not taking the chance. And so the the worst mistake are those that we are too afraid to make and love is the it's always worth the risk in the end you know i think sometimes we can have been hurt or things have not gone the way that we wanted to so that we we hide and we we always are are scared when we come to that that fork in the road of like oh my gosh this is going to go i don't even want to take this chance or make this mistake or take this risk because I know that it could go and become a mistake. But every beautiful thing in our life has had that that risk that it could be a mistake or it could be the start of a beautiful love story or it could be the start of um, a wonderful career. You know, like you have to take the risk. And that's just something that I hope you guys get from this book. Um Let's see. 
somebody asked like, is this a new career path and something you want to continue to do? And yes, it is. That is why I am so passionate about talking about this and, and want you guys to, to read this book because I've had, you guys have supported me so much and everything I've, I've gotten to do and want to do, but this is, this is something that I want to really, you know, make into something big. Like, you know, I want people to go out and buy this book. I want it. I'm putting it out there. Like I would love for it to be, you know, a bestseller and people to just flock to, to read this book and then want to see it in different ways. I want, I want to be able to, for this book to turn into a movie or a TV series. Like I'm putting it out there. Everybody wants that to happen. And it can sometimes feel scary to, to say it out loud, but if you don't say it out loud, it's not going to happen. But like, that is what I want for, this book. And then I want to continue to tell stories. Um, other people ask, like, is there a book too? And there, I'm already working on book two right now in the midst of all this. I am, I am on book two and I'm so excited because I do believe there's going to be a character in here that you guys are going to be like, what we need to know more about. And, you know, hopefully delivering that and working on that right now. But I would love to be able to share the stories of all the core four and to see that, you know, be on a screen someday. So like that is the goal for me. So you go out there, buy you a book, <laughs> buy two, buy one for your mom, buy one for your sister, like help me make this dream come true because this is, this is what I want to do. And so excited about book, book two. Um, and I have a book tour right now, um, that's going on. I will be in New York, LA, St. Louis, um, Birmingham, Tuscaloosa, Nashville. So we, uh, San Diego, we're going all over. So if you are like, okay, Hannah, I hear you. I want to buy your book, but I also want to see you. And I want to like get my book signed, do all the things come to one of those events and I can't wait to see you there. We'll get to hang out a lot. Some of those events um, are signings and some are signings with like conversations of me talking more about the book and everything going on. So check that out. I'll have that on. Um, we'll, we'll try to put some of that info on line somewhere on my socials. Maybe we can put it in the description where you can find all that information. Um, but the book is out for you all to enjoy this week. You can get it online. You can get it at Barnes & Noble, wherever you get your, your books. There's some signed copies that you can find. Um, so check it out. So, so pumped. Um, and let me know what you think. Thank you guys for supporting me on this. Um, it means so much to me. Like your time means so much to me. And then just... Yeah, supporting this dream is awesome. But before we go, I have a little treat for you. If you're still not convinced and you still, you know, want to read more, you're more of an audio book gal, totally get it. Um, I did not read for the audio book. I had to audition for my own book, and <laughs> which is hilarious because this is very different. Um, I did get it. I did. <laughs> I did nail my audition, but y'all, like, there is some like juicy scenes in this um, book and I just couldn't read that for you guys. <laughs> like it just felt weird. And so um, we have Juliet Guglia. I think I'm saying her name right. I'm not sure, but she's amazing. I got to pick, there was a lot of auditions and she was True, she's amazing. So she is narrating the audiobook, and we have a little sample for you guys to check out. So here you go. Here is a little sample of Mistakes We Never Made, and I hope you enjoy it. You can also get it on audiobook if this is your jam, but here's a little taste. Chapter one Wednesday night, three days before the wedding. The great thing about tequila is that it's not just a drink. It's an activity. Lick, shoot, suck. Salt, tequila, lime. And an activity is something we 
desperately need. Earlier this afternoon, Sybil and I dropped our bags in the cottage we're sharing, at least until she marries Jamie on Saturday. Then I'll bunk with Nikki. Her eyes had gone wide when I fanned out four identical laminated copies of our itinerary on the white oak coffee table. Emma, this is so thorough. And it was. Complimentary hotel golf carts arrive at 7.10 p.m. Disembark at the Pelican Club at 7.25 p.m. Enjoy sunset and take photos 7.30 p.m. to 8 p.m. Seated for dinner at 8.15 p.m. Some might call it anal, but I just call it being prepared. We had been progressing right on schedule. Five-star dinner, check. Oceanfront views, check. But now, a lull seems to have settled over our party. Full bellies and weak drinks will do that to you. Nikki has been sipping the same glass of rosé for an hour, while Willow nurses a non-alcoholic black pepper mango spritz. And Sybil has barely touched the rose water and pistachio martini the bartender spent 10 minutes concocting. I covertly glance at my phone. It's only 9.45. This is bordering on pathetic. We're four women in our prime. Well, that is, if you consider prime to mean heartbroken, Nikki, pregnant, Willow, and possibly about to be fired, me. But no one can deny that Sybil is a woman in her prime. And this night was supposed to be about her. The wedding had come together in such a whirlwind that we didn't have time for a real bachelorette. But I had at least hoped that the core four coming to Malibu a day early for the festivities would allow us one unforgettable night to toast away Sybil's singledom. After mentally flipping through my itinerary of activities for the evening to see if there was anything I could shuffle around to revive our flagging group, there was only one option. I'm going to get us tequila shots! I stand and adjust the sweetheart neckline of my most recently purchased Reformation sundress, brushing at the wrinkles. Nikki perks up a bit. I would do a shot. We're all going to do one. It's tradition. We do shots whenever one of us has a big win or a life event. We did them when Nikki got picked to go on the reality show Loved By, when I got my first big design job, when Willow got married last year. I'd even scheduled it to make sure we didn't forget. 11.15 p.m. Tequila shots. We had to have shots for Sybil's wedding. She may have been engaged three times, but she's only going to get married once. Sybil, you're drinking Willow's too. I'll be right back and then we can play the game. Sybil's eyes narrow. What game? It was on the itinerary, I call over my shoulder, already halfway to the bar. You're gonna love it. The bartender, a white guy in his early 30s, is fairly cute. If only in a this bun and beard make up most of my identity kind of way. I flash the smile that's worked on bartenders since I was a freshman at the University of Texas, trying to convince them that I actually was Carly Mullerin, 22 and from Elk City, Oklahoma. Not Emma Townsend, an 18-year-old pie-fi from Dallas with a $120 fake ID. It's been a decade since those desperate days, but we need to get this show on the road, so I crank the charm to 11. My friend Willow says the spritz you made her is the best drink she's had since finding out she was pregnant, I tell him, even though what Willow actually said was that it tasted like air freshener and she'd kill for a Moscato. Drying a wine glass, the bartender just nods, So I plow ahead. No use wasting charm on an unreceptive audience. Four tequila shots, please. While I wait for the bartender to pour our drinks, I take a moment to look at the material of the bar. It's a bone-colored marble with a sleek waterfall edge that adds a much-needed tension with the more boho vibes of the rest of the decor. I'm surprised that it's still in such good shape after being outside in the elements. I don't usually recommend using marble outdoors to my clients, since it's so soft. Maybe it's brand new. Otherwise, I need to ask what sealant they used. Unfortunately, I can't serve shots. I look up from the marble. Pardon? It's against the hotel's policy. 
He seems entirely too pleased to be telling me the hotel's policy on alcoholic portioning. I feel the flicker of a challenge, and I fixate on it. I haven't had a ton of wins lately, but I'm not going back to our table without these shots. We're going to celebrate Sybil whether this bartender wants to help or not. What about four tequilas neat? I ask, and shift my smile from friendly to conspiratorial. He looks like he's about to refuse, so I follow with a kill shot. That man at the table, by the fire pit, has a glass of whiskey, neat. It really wouldn't be fair for us to not have our tequilas neat, would it? He gives me a look that says he isn't particularly impressed, but must decide it's not worth the fight. I can give you sipping tequila, he says tightly, turning to the collection of bottles behind him. Instead of pouring the alcohol into shot glasses, he lines up four tulip-shaped glasses. This is an aged añejo. On the nose, you'll find a soft bouquet of lemongrass, melon, and a touch of butterscotch. He unscrews the top. The palate opens with a hint of charred grapefruit rind, harvest grasses, and a light scent of caramel. I nod along, as if I have any idea what harvest grasses are supposed to taste like. It finishes with a strong pepper spice. Oh, I love some spice. Could we have four lime wedges? He looks at me like only an absolute heathen would shoot his sipping tequila and destroy the aftertaste of pepper spice with a wedge of lime. I don't have any limes. Okay, lemon will work. No lemons either, ma'am. That gets my attention. You're, are you messing with me? I plaster on a smile, hoping against hope that this is just a mixologist's attempt at humor. We only use in-season ingredients grown on the property, ma'am. It's Southern California. Everything is always in season. Limes are a winter fruit. It is June. And y'all couldn't have gotten some from the grocery store? I take my work very seriously. Some of us care about quality control and our carbon footprints. It takes him a beat, but he tacks on, ma'am. That initial flicker of a challenge now roars to life. I have to have a lime. It's tradition, and not just for the core four, but for humanity in general. Salt, tequila, lime. It's practically sacred. I think back to when we arrived at the restaurant, and an idea blossoms. Isn't there a giant floral arrangement near the host stand filled with limes? A vein above the bartender's left eyebrow twitches. Victory. I have no control over the aesthetic choices of the hotel's design staff. Okay, well, I'm going to take these glasses of aged jalapeno, añejo. Aged añejo, I correct as I clink all four glasses together, and sip them very slowly. If you could just add this to my tab. I'm not about to be bested by some snobby bartender. I'm getting one of those limes. I turn back toward the table, drinks in hand, to see Sybil perched precariously on the deck railing, chatting with a man who has made his way to our table, drawn like a moth to a flame. He leans in to whisper something in her ear. Sybil tosses her blonde hair and shoots him a megawatt smile in response, but then shakes her head and holds up her left hand the stunning four-carat diamond catching the glow from the bar's Edison string lights. The man throws a hand to his heart like he's gutted, and Sybil consoles him, placing her right hand on his shoulder, which means she now has zero hands on the railing. Oh, no, no, no. My espadrilles are sturdy, but they aren't built for speed. It's 15 feet down to the sand, and a broken-legged Sybil would probably constitute a massive failure of my maid of honor duties. The glasses rattle against the slick, polished wood of the table as I rush to put them down and reach for Sybil right as she begins to wobble, pulling her back onto the deck. Sybil's admirer hovers awkwardly, as if waiting to see if he and Sybil will continue their conversation. Great to meet you, Glenn, she says genuinely, but I've got to get back to girls' night. The man wanders back to his table, grinning as he reaches his buddies. 
I've seen that look a thousand times before. High off the adrenaline of having mustered up the courage to talk to Sybil in the first place and feeling like they really hit it off. If only he had gotten to her first, they would have lived happily ever after. Of course, in reality, Sybil could do leagues better than this middle-aged guy with a guacamole stain on his polo, but that's just how Sybil makes people feel. Special. Chosen. Like her magical light might fall on you, too, if you just stick by her side. Sybil and I met in the cafeteria of Eisenhower Elementary. It was a few weeks after my dad left us, and I was the new girl at school, which was pretty much the worst thing you can be as an eight-year-old. On the first day, Mom sent me wearing a bandana shirt and a pair of thrifted denim shorts that she had updated by sewing on a bright trim with dangling rainbow beads. I'd loved the way they rattled together every time I took a step, like just walking was something worth celebrating. But clutching my red plastic tray and looking around for somewhere to sit, I quickly began to regret my one-of-a-kind ensemble. The other girls all wore those cool, scrunchy micro t-shirts and a brand of jeans I'd never heard of. They looked like they'd walked off the pages of a limited two catalog, while I looked like my mommy's arts and crafts project. I sat down alone at the end of a table, beads digging into the backs of my legs, and prayed that the next half hour would go by fast. But then, a bright-eyed blonde girl plopped down in the empty seat beside me, snapped open her Lisa Frank lunchbox, said, I like your style. My mom never lets me wear anything cool, and handed me half of a grasshopper brownie. And that was that. It was like she took my insecurities and recast them into something exceptional. Suddenly, I wasn't a weirdo in handmade clothes. I had style. I wasn't alone and friendless. I had Sybil. And ever since that day, I've kept her close. With Sybil firmly back in her seat, I motioned toward the tequila. I almost had to commit a felony to get these from the bartender, so you better drink up. Nikki looks up from her phone and gives the bartender a predatory once-over. He's very pretty. Nikki, no. Nikki has been tearing through men after her recent breakup. He's very insufferable. And besides, I told you, you've hit your man bun quota for the month. Now don't touch these. I have to go grab a lime. Willow gives me a salute. I will guard them. I head out of the bar and back through the restaurant, swiping a salt shaker from one of the tables as I go. Like a woman on a mission. I weave through the white linen tablecloths and rattan chairs, hoping that the Pelican Club patrons don't notice the slightly wild look of determination in my eyes. I hate it when I find myself typifying the fiery redhead cliche, but sometimes I just can't help it. When I commit to something, I commit. And right now, I'm committed to making sure Sybil's wedding weekend goes off without a hitch. I can admit to myself that the maid of honor really should have been Willow. After all, she's known Sybil the longest, ever since their mothers took a mommy and me music in the park class together 28 years ago. And she's always so serene and unflappable. She wouldn't have let her need to best the bartender pull her away from her friends. But the pregnancy hasn't been easy for her, and I know Sybil didn't want to add any more stress to her life. Nikki would have been a great maid of honor, too. Or at least pre-breakup Nikki would have been. She was there when Sybil first met Jamie and had a front row seat for all the major milestones in their relationship. But despite the many perfectly posed and flawlessly filtered photos she posts, it's clear that she's still hurting from her nationally televised breakup. And still not over Aaron. In the end... I guess it does make sense that Sybil asked me to be her maid of honor. Our friendship has always functioned on a similar dynamic. Sybil, the glowing star of the show. Me, the best friend keeping things on track behind the scenes. I know it might sound like that makes things unbalanced between us, but it's not like that. She coaxes me out of my comfort zone 
And I make sure she has a soft place to land after each wild adventure she embarks on. I take pride in knowing what's best for Sybil and all my friends and making sure she gets it. Right now, what she needs is a lime. I reach the gorgeous floral arrangement in the entryway. It's an explosion of greens. Bells of Ireland are a subtle Kelly. The magnolia leaves a dark, glossy emerald. Sprays of eucalyptus are a delicate blue-green pistachio. My mind wanders. Could my painter color match the electric chartreuse of the orchids? Before I remember my mission. There, at the bottom of the arrangement, piled high and juicy. Limes. I dart a quick look at the host stand. The woman there smiles back, but the phone rings, and she turns to the tablet in front of her. It's now or never. I zone in on a lime right in the middle, so as not to affect the symmetry of the arrangement. It's a bit of a reach to the center of the table, but I think I can make it. Teetering on the toes of my shoes, I realize too late that one pair of my laces has unknotted. Right as my hand closes on a lime, I lose my balance. I pitch myself backward so I don't topple over onto the arrangement, but before my ass makes contact with the Spanish tile, two warm hands steady my hips, pulling away as soon as I'm stable. As I turn to thank my rescuer, the smile on my face ices over, but I can still feel the heat of his hands around my waist. Hands I know well. Hands that have skimmed up the bare skin of my calves toward my knee and... No, stop. It's not like that anymore. I shut my eyes as if my lids have the power to change the reality before me. But when I open them a second later, I'm staring straight into deep brown eyes. Dark, but flecked with amber so they look like light through a glass of whiskey. The eyes of none other than thin, frickin' hues. All right, guys, how'd you love it? I hope you are hooked and you are on the way to um, buy the book to, to finish out, to see what happens with them and then Thank you guys so much and hope you have a great day. Thank you guys so much for listening to the episode. Better Tomorrow is produced by me, Hannah Brown, and Legos Creative. Our show is recorded, engineered, and edited by the Legos Creative team. Remember to follow Better Tomorrow wherever you get your podcasts so you don't miss the next episode. And don't forget to rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. It really helps and shows your support. You can follow me on socials at Hannah Brown, and you can stay updated on all things Better Tomorrow on our Instagram at Better Tomorrow and our TikTok Better Tomorrow podcast. <laughs>